Welcome everyone and happy Friday. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is Kristen Uhlenbrock from the U.S. Clivar Project Office. I'm glad that you all have tuned in today. This is the second half of a two-part series that we're running um, that is based on our latest edition of Variations, which is our quarterly newsletter. Um, the Variations was called A Tale of Two Blobs and featured a set of articles from the scientific community. Uh, the first set focused on the North Pacific and the warm blob and, and sea surface temperature anomalies over the past few years. And the second set, which we're going to be hearing about today, is called the cold blob of the North Atlantic, which I'm sure many of you kind of heard about. Um, we have three presenters, and I'm going to introduce those momentarily. And we'll go through just a little bit of the logistics, and then we'll introduce the speakers. So each speaker is going to speak for about 12 to 13 minutes. Um, we'll have time for any brief sort of clarification questions right when they're done, maybe a minute or so of that. Um, but we do want you to hold all of your really substantive questions until the end, and we'd like to do a panel Q&A with all three speakers at the end. Um, when you do come up with your questions at the end, um, try to address them to a one of the specific speakers if you have them, unless they are for the full panel to chime in on. Um, you'll have two ways to ask questions of the speakers. You can type them in your chat box, which I'll be monitoring, and we'll ask those out loud. Um, you can also raise your hand when we get to the Q&A portion, and I can take you off mute. And I do ask that you please identify yourself so everyone who is tuned in can hear who's asking the question. And then you can have a little bit of dialogue with the panel there and any sort of back and forth that's needed. Um, you can also type in any technical questions you have into the chat function if you're having any problems hearing anything or, or something goes down, and I'll, I'll try to keep my eye out and monitor, monitor those for you. Um, also, just so you know, we're recording these webinars, and we're going to post those on the U.S. Clivar website and YouTube channel, so you can always go back and listen to these. And if you didn't get a chance to see Tuesday's one on the warm blob, that one's up online as well, and you can go back and watch that. Everyone is on mute. You're going to remain on mute um, throughout this. That'll cut down on any sort of background noise. Okay, we should, this should last about an hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our first three speakers, and then they'll go sequentially. Uh, first up is Simon Josie from the National Oceanography Center here in the UK, and he's going to go first. He's talking about a tale of a surprising cold blob in the North Atlantic. Uh, following Simon, we're going to have Steve Yeager from INCAR uh, out in Boulder. And following him will be Andrea Schmittner, who's at Oregon State University. And they'll kind of tell you, hopefully, as much as we know about this, and then whatever they don't get a chance to tell you, you'll have plenty of time to ask them questions about. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and let Simon kick us off. Simon, go ahead. Okay. Thanks very much, Kristen. Well, hopefully you can all uh, hear me okay. Sound and, great. Uh, okay. And I'm going to approach this, uh, uh, looking at this cold anomaly in the North Atlantic, uh, pretty much from a surface uh, flux perspective, and those of you who know me know that most of my research is concerned with ocean atmosphere interaction. And what I would try to convince you of is, is that the, uh, the cold anomaly that's developed over the last uh, uh, two to three years and peaked last summer is primarily a response, at least in the surface signal, uh, to uh, uh, ocean atmosphere interaction, extreme uh, heat loss in two winters in 2013-14 and 2014-15. So I shall cover those in some detail and then ask where we are now. Uh, have we had a return to normality in 2015-16? And I quickly acknowledge my co-authors at, uh, at the bottom there. Okay, I'm just mastering the controls, and I realize I've jumped forward two slides. Okay, so first of all, uh, an introductory slide about defining the blob. Uh, it's become clear to me, uh, anyway, that from recent conversations and talks I've given, that different people think of the blob in different ways. Some people are thinking in terms of a, a centennial scale warming hole. Some people are thinking of decadal cooling uh, since about 2005 6 But the record breaking uh, temperatures, which have really caught attention, have actually developed in the last two to three years. And that's something that we've been working on. And much of this work is actually uh, uh, discussed in a paper under, re under review at present with environmental research letters. So first of all, defining the, the cold blob, uh, what you're seeing here is a mixture of fields from the NSEP reanalysis and on the right-hand side, uh, National Oceanographic Data Center in the UK. That's essentially World Ocean Database stuff. Um, and when we look at last summer, uh, June, July, August, these, these are the record-breaking cold temperatures. And actually, they should be stippled, but they're not on there. But much of that region has coldest temperatures uh, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years uh, in that summer. And you can see that in the time series at the bottom, 
which is a box average uh, sea surface temperature value, and we see in the, uh, 2015 in the summer with the coldest value uh, throughout that period in 60 years. Likewise, if we go over to the uh, top 700 meters ocean heat content anomaly, uh, just two different estimates of that in red and the blue there, we can see well, we can see an, an increase, which is well known from 95, mid 90s through to about 2005, and then a decrease. So that decrease falls off a cliff edge at the end, and that occurs following the winter of 2013 and 14. We have a very sharp decrease in ocean heat content over that top 700 meters. And that's brought out more in the, in the uh, next slide, which shows well, the bottom right panel, which shows the uh, boxed average temperature anomaly as a function of depth down to 2,000 meters. And we can see a reduction in temperatures over about a decadal period. But when we get to 2014, there's a massive expansion of this cold, and cold blob. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about today. So in terms of the surface forcing, uh, we have a paper which has, uh, has finally appeared, actually, I think it's in Climate Dynamics June edition. It went online last year. And this is uh, one by Jeremy Grist, which looks at the winter of 2013-14. And I've also written a, a highlights piece for this with a bit more uh, uh, um, context for it in the BAM State of the Climate article last summer as well. And what we're looking at here, uh, two different fields, uh, ECMWF, so area interim, and NSEP reanalysis are pretty much the same thing, the surface heat flux field. Uh, in that winter 2013-14, we can see strong signals in both cases. And those strong signals are associated with very strong northerly flows and northwesterly flows uh, in the eastern subpolar gyre. And when we come to look at the pressure pattern and look at the atmospheric mode indices, in this first winter, although it's a bit of a mix, the first winter is dominated by the second mode of variability, the East Atlantic pattern, uh, the index of which is quite, quite a lot stronger than that for the NAO. The North Atlantic Oscillation is quite weak in this winter, so it's not the main driver of what's happening. Let me look at the uh, right. I just wanted to show that as well, just to convince you that the, um, the uh, heat loss is a, a record for that period. So that's the box average heat loss. And we can, show, we can see the strongest value uh, over that 35-year period spanned by era interim. Now, there's quite a bit of detail. I won't uh, spend too much time on this on the heat flux component contributions to this uh, extreme winter in the paper that we have in climate dynamics. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's due to a con combination of latent and sensible heat losses. And when you go down into the, uh, uh, the um, component terms or the driving terms for this, which are the humidity and uh, temperature difference, we can see uh, very significant anomalies there. And that's coupled with very strong wind speeds. That's what's driving these, um, that's what's driving these uh, um, events. We've also done some, uh, and the other thing is we've done some analysis of the EN4 data set, which reveals that there's a strong subpolar mode water formation in winter 2013-14. Uh, and we've done some particle tracking. Uh, that's particularly done by my colleague, Jeremy Grist, which uh, shows evidence for a, a re-emergent signal uh, in the following autumn. And we do see, when we, when we track the SST signal through the year, uh, the cold anomaly, which is produced by winter 2013-14, pretty much uh, uh, disappears through the summer. But when you come to October, and in particular November, we can see this very uh, uh, strong cold anomaly re-emerging uh, in this uh, eastern subpolar gyre region. So that's all very interesting. And uh, that winter on its own, 2013-14, would have produced a signal worth, uh, worth talking about. Before I come on to the following winter, I'll also make the point that there were impacts elsewhere from 2013-14. So this is from the BAMS article. And uh, Dagmar Kika and Igor Yashayev have noted at length uh, the fact that there's new uh, Labrador seawater formation this winter and the first since 2007-2008. Uh, so what followed on from 2013-14 as an air sea flux person it was very interesting. So these, these two winters were, the, were, were two of the most extreme in the past 40 years. And the second winter, 2014-15, was curious because the, heat, the zone of strong heat loss is displaced to the north uh, from the one in 2013-14. So we have a, the opportunity for a double whammy. and. Uh, uh, when this, the re-emergent SST signal uh, comes up, that modifies the air-sea interaction in this region. That's why we're seeing a reduced um, heat loss there. But we have a, a very strong heat loss to the north, and that has the opportunity to expand this cold anomaly and produce a broader uh, cold anomaly. And I just also make the point that uh, what's happening in this winter in terms of the atmospheric circulation is a bit different to the preceding one. Uh, when you start to look at it, it's more of an NAO-type winter. And when you start to look at the NAO index values in 2014-15, you see a run of, I think it's six or seven months with uh, continually positive 
and significant uh, strong values for the NAO, or tailing off towards the end. This is very unusual in the record. So this second winter is, is certainly dominated by the North Atlantic Oscillation. And again, if we take a box average of the heat flux, we can see that it's uh, uh, the uh, most extreme winter in record for this more northerly region. OK, so that's all uh, interesting. But now let's come on to the blob. This is one of the pictures uh, which came to everybody's attention last summer uh, from NOAA. And uh, we can see record coldest uh, anomalies uh, in the North Atlantic. And there was a lot of speculation at the time about whether this was uh, uh, due to a decline in the AMOC, potentially uh, driven by freshwater or ice melt uh, related terms. We're going to hear about that, I think, in the third talk. Um, but uh, my immediate take on this it was, well, we've had two extreme winters. To what extent can we explain this signal in, in terms of the heat loss over those two winters? And I'll argue that we can actually explain it uh, quite well just by taking the SE interaction into account. Now, in the paper which is uh, under review, hopefully it'll be accepted soon, we've looked at the SE interaction. We've looked at the uh, wind-driven upwelling contribution to the uh, cold temperature anomalies. That's pretty small, um, about uh, uh, 5 to 10%. We've also looked at change in ocean heat transport using the 41 north values of Josh Willis estimates. That's also pretty small, about 10 to 20 percent. And what we find in the detailed budget analysis is that in terms of the ocean heat content change, about 70 percent of that over that two, uh, two to three year period can be explained in terms of the ASC interaction, the increased heat loss. Uh, so that's in terms of the ocean heat content uh, down to about 700 meters. But what I'm going to focus on here is the uh, the cold blob is seen in that previous slide. So the, in terms of the sea surface temperature expression, um, I'm showing in the, in the right-hand uh, bottom panel the observed blob. This is what we have in June 2015. This is what was catching the headlines. And prior to that, uh, um, prior to that time, we had in November 14 this initial condition, if you like, this re-emergent signal uh, forced by the previous winter, 2013-14. Now you can do uh, a fairly simple calculation. Uh, with the integrated heat fluxes over the intervening period from December through to May 2015, apply them over a, re a reasonable uh, uh, assumption for the mixed layer depth, and see whether you can get an SST signal which looks like the, uh, the one that's observed. And you can do this using climatological monthly mixed layer depths, or you can simply say, let's take the average mixed layer depth over the period, which for that box it actually turns out to be about 120 meters. We just did a, it took 100 meters because we were just trying to, 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 to show that in terms of an order of magnitude calculation, we could explain this with the surface fluxes. When you do that calculation, we're now looking, uh, this is the, uh, the net heat flux averaged over that intervening, intervening period, December 14 to May 2015. And we see that the implied blob, when we simply add the initial, add the initial SST field to the uh, uh, implied signal by distributing that net heat flux over the uh, top 100 meters, we get this uh, map here. Uh, so this is the implied blob. And it looks pretty much like the observed blob. So we're quite happy uh, that we can explain uh, a significant amount of that surface temperature structure with reasonable assumptions about the surface forcing effects. Now, one of the criticisms you get straight away when you do this was, oh, well, you took NSEP, and I don't like NSEP for some reason. Somebody will say, uh, well, what happens if you take a different data set? But if you take a different data set, you get pretty much the same result. So here we have either interim now and NSEP side by side. Uh, on the top, we have the observed SFTs from both data sets. Uh, in November 14, they're different resolutions. And then we have the observed cold blob anomalies in June 15. Uh, and that's what you're seeing in that middle row. And then if you take separately the surface heat fluxes from NSEP uh, and do the calculation I described previously, you get this result. And if you do the same thing with ECMWF fluxes, you get this result. So in each case, uh, we're getting estimated SST anomalies, which are close to the observed SST anomalies, both with ECMWF and with NSEP. So it explains uh, uh, anomalous winter heat loss can explain much of the surface uh, cold signal with, uh, independently of which reanalysis you choose. Where are we now? So I'm working towards the close here. I think I've got a, about two or three minutes left or four minutes left, hopefully. Um, and uh, what I would say about 2015-16, this is work in progress, in fact. Uh, we see, compared to those previous two winters, uh, fairly neutral conditions in terms of the ASC exchange. This is the anomalous net ASC exchange you're looking at in that bottom right panel. Uh, not much is going on in the Atlantic. And if you look at the uh, um, pressure patterns associated with that field, then they're relatively weak compared to the preceding two winters. So uh, my personal expectation is that this cold anomaly will damp away through 2016. There are signs that, that, is, that this is happening. Okay, 
So I think I'm going to come to a penultimate slide. Um, I should give credit here to my colleague, Aurélie Duchet, who I think is, is listening. Uh, she had a version of this slide in a different talk I heard earlier this week. I've modified it slightly, just trying to capture what's happened over this period. So starting in 2013, we had a winter of intense ocean heat loss, which was associated with the, with the state of the East Atlantic pattern. Um, then that generated a cold surface anomaly, which was subducted and reemerged uh, primarily in November 2014. We then had a second extreme winter and extreme heat loss in the spring as well, primarily associated with uh, uh, NAO conditions, North Atlantic Oscillation dominated, and that resulted in this big blue blob anomaly in the summer of 2015. Subsequent to that, we've had a winter of normal heat loss. So where we are now is there's still a remnant of the blob there, but it's not as strong as it was uh, at this time last year. So my final slide, um, I'm not going to make these points again. I've already made them. But I'm going to give you a taster for what else is in this uh, paper that we have under review. And that is that we think that this cold anomaly has significant impacts on uh, temperatures over Europe. So thinking back to the very first slide, the, the sharp-eyed amongst you will have noticed that there were very warm temperatures over Europe in that summer. And we believe that the strong increase in SST gradient in the North Atlantic has an impact on the jet stream displaces it southwards, leading to a European heat wave. But that's another story for another talk, and I'll leave that to uh, perhaps orally in the future to tell you about that one. So I'll finish there. Thank you, Simon. Great job. Um, any real brief clarification questions for Simon before we move on to Steve? Um, like I mentioned earlier, and for those who've tuned in, we're going to do a, a larger Q&A with the panel after all three are done. But we do have time for a brief question. You can either type it in or raise your hand. Um, looks like we have one quick one from Rachel we'll take. How does 2015-16 look with depth? Does going back to normal, in quotes, mean going back to the 10-year trend of cooling? OK, so I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure I've got the question properly. So you're asking, is, what, is, what is the uh, vertical distribution of the heat content anomaly in 2015-16 winter? Um, I haven't done that calculation yet. What I've primarily been looking at is the integrated surface sorting over that time. And that, that I would say, is close, to, is close to normal. And the SST signal uh, is weaker. Uh, now than it was at the onset of, uh, uh, of, of last, uh, what, uh, than it was a year ago. So I can't really answer your question uh, directly, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks, Simon, very much. And uh, we'll come back to you with the rest of the panel at the end. And so now I'd like to invite uh, Steve to go ahead and give us his presentation. Sure. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about this article, What Caused the Atlantic Cold Blob of 2015? Uh, that I wrote with uh, my colleague Hu Kim here at NCAR, as well as John Robson from University of Reading. And so this is a plot that Simon has already showed. It actually shows the percentiles for the, the full year of uh, 2015, uh, showing this uh, record cold uh, region in the far north Atlantic, surrounded by a much broader region of much cooler than average temperatures for that year. and um, the, the perspective we're bringing is, is more of a modeling perspective. We're looking at uh, uh, plausible explanations uh, at, at all different time scales uh, for what might have uh, driven this cold blob. So here are some uh, hypotheses that we explore in the article. Um, one answer might be that humans caused the cold blob of 2015 by emitting greenhouse gases, warming the planet, and causing a long-term weakening of the large-scale Atlantic circulation. That would be a centennial time scale explanation. Uh, another would be that this is a manifestation of natural decadal variability, the so-called Atlantic multi-decadal variability, associated with slow variations in the strength of the large-scale Atlantic circulation. And finally, uh, we consider the, the impact of weather uh, along the lines of, of what Simon just uh, talked about, that there are a series of anomalously strong uh, winter forcings in this region uh, that extracted heat from, from the ocean. Uh, it would be more of a, an annual time scale explanation for the cold blob. And what, what we uh, more or less conclude is that all of the above were at work uh, to explain the cold blob. It was a confluence of, uh, of influences operating at, at all these different time scales. But in particular, the, the decadal and annual uh, forcings associated with uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation are the proximate uh, drivers of the cold blob in our view. Uh, 
So the the first uh, answer, the, the 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 centennial scale uh, uh, cooling in the North Atlantic uh, was was made uh, uh, quite visible recently in this uh, paper by Romstorf et al. in Nature's Climate Change that came out in early 2015, and uh, and certainly influenced some of the uh, uh, the coverage of the cold blob in the media. So they argue in this paper that there is an exceptional 20th century slowdown in the Atlantic Ocean overturning circulation. Um, and this plot here on the left shows the linear trend of observed surface temperature from 1901 to 2013, showing uh, that in the North Atlantic there's actually been a cooling trend, which uh, all other things being equal would, would be conducive to having record cold temperatures in modern times. And they associate this cooling trend with uh, a slowdown in the AMOC. They uh, come up with a, an index based on the difference between the uh, subpolar gyre uh, uh, temperature uh, shown in the, the upper right orange curve uh, uh, sub and subtract that um, from the northern hemisphere average surface temperature, which uh, shows a, a very pronounced uh, warming signal, and that difference, they argue, is is a, a good proxy for the the strength of the overturning circulation. And so, this observed warming hole in the subpolar North Atlantic may be due to a, a dramatic anthropogenic weakening of AMOC, which they associate with the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And so, what we did is uh, looked at how this manifests in our uh, 20th century ensemble simulations using the community earth system model. So the, the CESM large ensemble is a 35 member ensemble of historical coupled climate simulations from 1920 to 2015. And if you take the ensemble mean of those uh, 35 members, you have a pretty good uh, estimation of the externally forced response of the climate system, averaging out all of the uh, internal variability in the climate system. And so in the uh, upper left here, I'm showing you the, um, the linear surface temperature tre SST trend from ERSST observations, show, again showing this cooling trend in the uh, subpolar North Atlantic. And on the, uh, in panel B is the ensemble mean from this uh, coupled climate uh, ensemble. And it shows a fairly good resemblance to observations suggesting that uh, much of this long-term trend can be associated with uh, an externally forced uh, response uh, of the climate system. Um, and that includes all of the forcings, greenhouse gases, plus natural and anthropogenic aerosols. Now, if I look at the, the time series of SST averaged within that uh, black box, um, that's shown in panel C. Uh, the observations are in red and the, um, the large ensemble, uh, ensemble mean is shown as the thick black curve here, um, and the uh, long-term trends are shown as the dashed line. So it's, again, showing the, the nice agreement with observations from our ensemble mean. The gray shading shows the uh, spread of the ensemble members, so this externally forced uh, trend is, is a very small con contributor to the overall variance in this region, which is dominated by uh, decadal variability, and, and that's a well-known result for this region. Um, but uh, it, it, do, it does suggest that there is uh, um, uh, uh, a preconditioning for uh, record lows in modern times associated with this long-term cooling. And the um, the, the, the nuance here is that there's competing tendencies at work in the subpolar North Atlantic. We have a, a, a radiatively forced warming being counteracted by uh, an indirect AMOC-driven cooling in this region. And so even though the, uh, the long-term trend is quite modest, if you um, highlight those competing tendencies by looking at a warming hole index along the lines of Romstorf et al., so that's panel D now, uh, looking at the difference um, of the subpolar North Atlantic SST minus the northern hemisphere average SST, 
you see uh, this uh, more pronounced signal, so a deepening of the warming hole, um, which in the CESM large ensemble does appear to be related to uh, an externally forced decline in AMOC. That's shown in the uh, green curve in panel D. And so the, 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 the model simulations do appear to be uh, um, uh, supporting the hypothesis that there's a, uh, a long-term decline in AMOC going on uh, over the course of the 20th century that is deepening the warming hole and, and um, preconditioning the subpolar North Atlantic for uh, record lows. Um, so that is in agreement with the Romsdorf conclusion. However, if you look a little bit deeper at the relationship between the, this warming hole index and AMOC in the CESM large ensemble, you find that um, it's, it's, a, it's a good proxy for the externally forced signal, but not necessarily uh, good for the uh, internal decadal variability of AMOC. And so um, I'm showing you that uh, in this correlation plot that shows the, um, the distribution of warming hole index AMOC correlations across the ensemble members. So we've got 35 ensemble members, and most of those correlations are on the order of uh, 0.6 or 0.7, so explaining less than half of the variance of AMOC. And then the ensemble, in the ensemble mean, that's shown in red, the correlation is much higher. So it is true that uh, the warming hole index is probably go a good proxy for looking at uh, long time scale externally forced variability in AMOC, but perhaps not such a good proxy uh, for looking at the internal or decadal AMOC variations. Um, nevertheless, uh, we conclude that the, the CESM large ensemble seems to lend support to this hypothesis that there's been a slowdown in AMOC over the last century that helped to precondition the SPNA for record cold in modern times. But what was special about 2015? Why uh, did we get uh, cold blob in, in this year in particular? And to answer that question, we have to uh, uh, look more in detail at these decadal variations that dominate the observed record. So. Um, looking again at this time series of subpolar North Atlantic SST, um, you can see that in observations, the, the variability is dominated by these multi-decadal swings um, with uh, anomalously cold uh, temperatures uh, it, from the 70s to the uh, early 90s, followed by this uh, well-known rapid uh, mid-90s warming, and now we appear to be uh, heading back into a, a colder phase of the uh, North, North Atlantic. And numerous studies have established a link between this decadal um, subpolar SST variability and ocean thermohaline circulation changes, driven to first order by uh, cumulative winter NAO buoyancy forcing. And so if I uh, take a look at the last 60 years or so of uh, North Atlantic oscillation, what you see is this uh, ramp up from the early 60s to the mid 90s, uh, followed by this, uh, uh, this shift to more uh, neutral conditions post-1996. Um, and this is related to decadal variations in the rate of North Atlantic deep water formation. So if you look at the bottom panel, this is again showing winter NAO in blue. And the green curve is showing uh, an observation-based estimate of the formation rate of North Atlantic deep water over a broad region in the North Atlantic. And so the, as the NAO increased to the early 90s, we see this uh, decadal scale ramp up in the formation of North Atlantic deep water, uh, followed by uh, more uh, quiescent formation in, in recent years. So there's this decadal variability associated with NAO that comes through uh, this this buoyancy forced uh, change in formation rates. But there's also a, a faster time scale uh, variability associated with NAO, associated with the heat fluxes along the lines uh, of what Simon was just talking about. So in, in the middle panel here, I'm showing you uh, the NAO along with a estimate of the turbulent heat flux over that subpolar North Atlantic box. 
And you can see that when NaO is large and positive, you tend to have more turbulent heat extraction from that region. Um, and so we have both of these things going on um, associated primarily with the North Atlantic Oscillation forcing. So if we consider how that uh, forcing uh, drives uh, an, an ocean hindcast simulation, um, it gives us a, a way to estimate the heat budget of the subpolar North Atlantic. So now I'm looking at the, um, the blue curve in the top panel, which uh, is the subpolar North Atlantic SST from a, a forced hindcast over the historical period, showing quite good agreement with the observed SST variability. And the heat budget of that region uh, down to 300 meters is shown in the bottom panel. So this is from a forced ocean model simulation uh, of the last 60 years. And uh, what's apparent from this heat budget decomposition is that there's, there's a lot of variability on, on all different time scales, but a very clear decadal uh, uh, change from um, anomalously low advective heat convergence into the subpolar North Atlantic in the 70s and 80s, and then uh, a switch to uh, uh, strong oceanic heat convergence uh, in the mid-90s. And that is largely what we think is driving this mid-90s warming in this region, that uh, enhanced oceanic heat convergence shown by the blue line. Now, since about 2000, there's been a, a, a slow decline in that heat convergence into this region. Uh, and we think that's uh, responsible for the decadal modulation of heat content in this region. And this we attribute to the, uh, the, the post-1996 years of weak uh, North Atlantic deep water formation, slowing down the thermohaline circulation and causing this uh, decadal scale decline in heat convergence into the region. What we also see uh, from this heat budget is if you look right at um, the, the, the more recent years, uh, there's this precipitous drop in heat content that Simon talked about in uh, the winter of 2013-14. In our heat budget, that uh, is due to both surface fluxes, but also uh, a strong oceanic heat convergent component. So they're about uh, equally important in this budget and uh, giving this uh, unprecedented cooling tendency in 2013-2014, uh, uh, that's really um, what uh, caused the subpolar North Atlantic to cool and then subsequent uh, cooling uh, in 2015 uh, was sufficient to push temperatures into record territory. So our argument is that we're seeing a confluence of slow and fast time scale responses to NAO We've got a decadal modulation going on that's associated with the cumulative uh, uh, deep water formation. And then we also have this fast time scale associated with um, um, surface heat fluxes and uh, surface Ekman uh, uh, transport anomalies. So was the cold blob predictable? Um, Numerous studies now have shown that models initialized from NAO-driven ocean temperature, salinity, and density anomalies show skill at predicting decadal subpolar North Atlantic heat content and SST changes at multi-year lead times. You can see that uh, in the plot on the right. If you look at uh, panel D, for instance, it's showing you the three-year mean uh, upper 300-meter heat content time series, and um, that's shown in blue and red. Blue is the hindcast that we initialize our predictions from. Red is uh, an estimate from uh, the Met Office EN4 data set. And the, the black curve with shading is uh, uh, the results from our initialized decay prediction experiments using a, a fully coupled climate model ensembles initialized from the blue curve. And what you can see is that even at lead, lead years of uh, five to seven, we were able to predict this uh, mid-90s warming, and we, uh, our predictions show this uh, steady cooling uh, into the future, again, associated with the, uh, the recent history of anemic North Atlantic deep water formation. 
Um, and so several recent studies have anticipated uh, this cooling in the subpolar North Atlantic. This is based on the observed sharp decreases in Labrador seawater density associated with these, these uh, weak and neutral NAO forcings from 1996 to uh, 2011. And so several papers have come out uh, looking at the potential impacts of that, uh, of that uh, projected cooling. Um, however, if we look at our ability to predict the actual cold blob, uh, we see that uh, at least our prediction system was not able to predict the magnitude of that event. So the 2015 cold blob in terms of uh, SST is the uh, final point on this curve here. Uh, the blue and the red uh, agree um, that it, it was uh, near record for this, this regional average. But our predictions initialized on the previous, from the previous November, so th this uh, this uh, point on the black curve here represents the ensemble mean of predictions initialized on November 1st, 2014. They were not able to predict the magnitude of that um, uh, massive cooling, um, even though we have a 10-member ensemble here. None of the ensemble members predicted the magnitude of that cooling. And so this raises a number of questions that we'll have to look into, um, such as is the, is the model simulation of NAO deficient? We're not able to predict the, uh, the the severity of NAO that would have given us uh, the, the magnitude of cooling that was observed. Perhaps the ocean initial conditions are deficient. There are differences between blue and red here in terms of upper ocean heat content. Um, and so we're initializing our predictions from blue, but it might have been too warm uh, in this period compared to uh, um, uh, the Met Office analyses. Another question is, uh, might the ensemble size that we're using be too small to encompass uh, the magnitude of that kind of event. And so these are questions we'll have to look into in the future. And just to conclude, um, in summary, we, we argue that all of the above was at work in uh, the cold blob of 2015. The large ensemble of CESM suggests that we cannot rule out A as a contributing factor in the cold blob. Model simulations, uh, both forced time cast and initialized prediction simulations, as well as observation-based analyses of North Atlantic deep water and Labrador seawater density suggest that a decadal scale weakening of the Atlantic thermohaline circulation has been driving a persistent cooling of the subpolar North Atlantic since the mid-2000s. And furthermore, recent strong NAO plus winters, particularly the 2013-14 winter, have resulted in sharply decreased heat content there via turbulent heat flux and Ekman effects. So all three uh, time scales are at work here, and I'll conclude there. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. <clears throat> I think we're going to go ahead and move on to Andreas. Um, so if you have questions for Steve, keep those coming in, as well as Simon, and, and we're going to kind of collect these and, and let everyone talk, answer them at the end. So um, with that, let me take Andreas off mute. And Hello. Can care. you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Great. Go ahead, Andreas. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'm exploring a little bit longer time uh, time scales um, and the idea that perhaps the Greenland ice sheet uh, may have had something to do with the cold blob. Um, well, uh, in the um, in in the uh, variations piece, I take a little bit of a historic um, perspective and look at these er this early work of Manab and Stauffer, which uh, has inspired a lot of my research on, on the AMOC. Um, and, um, but before I, I go into this figure here from the original Manab and Stauffer paper, um, here is again the Ramsdorf paper in the upper left um, that Steve has shown before that shows the long-term uh, linear temperature trend from the observations with this warming hole here in the North Atlantic. And um, so to the degree that the warming hole is associated or has something to do uh, with the cold blob, um, the rest of the presentation will be um, concerned with the warming hole and not with the short time scale uh, variability that we heard um, Simon talk about. Uh, you've also seen this this figure. Steve has shown that as well from the Ramsdorf reconstruction, um, of, um, which um, implies it was something like a, a two sweat or so a reduction in the AMOC over the um, 20th century. 
um, and um, Ramsdorf implicate um, the Greenland of the melting uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet as a possible contribution to that AMOC slowdown. So we're I think we we may have some um, something to say about that possibility. But um, let let me come back to the original Manabe and Stauffer paper, which is shown down here, this black and white p uh, paper, um, wh where they show uh, uh, sea surface temperatures uh, from a four-time CO2 run at uh, 130 to 50 years after they started the, an exponential increase in atmospheric CO2. And what do they see in the North Atlantic, a region of relatively weak warming uh, compared to the surrounding areas that warm more. Uh, so you know, they have already identified the warming hole. It is really nothing new. Um, and um, so it's, it's been known for quite some time uh, in model simulations. Um, so the, the rest of the, uh, of the presentation here will be about um, a project that is funded by uh, NOAA within the US AMOC program that we call AMOC MIP. Um, and the, the goals of that project are, is to estimate um, effects of the Greenland ice sheet melting on the AMOC, um, which currently is not included in the IPCC model projections. So the concern was you know, that the IPCC models um, underestimate potentially the AMOC reduction in future projections because they do not include meltwater fluxes from Greenland. And that's what we were trying to um, uh, um, help with and, and consider in a, in a more realistic way than that had been done before, and also by using multiple IPCC class uh, models. We have estimated the surface melt est uh, melting rates um, in eight different drainage basins of, um, over the Greenland ice sheet um, based on regional climate model derived relationships between melt rates and um, mid-level mid temperatures. I'm going to show you a plot um, just in a second. Um, I should also note that we do not include changes in iceberg calving and subsurface melting from the ocean. Uh, because those are very difficult to quantify. So we, we only consider uh, changes in surface melt, which is uh, thought to be the dominant um, mass loss, um, uh, particularly for the future. Um, seven modeling groups have performed experiments with and without Greenland melting. And um, um, in order to explore the uncertainty more fully, we also um, use an emulator, which is a box model that is calibrated with each, each of these seven um, model GCM results. To, um, and we use that f to produce probabilistic projections. So here's the, um, um, the, here are the uh, eight different um, drainage basins of the Greenland ice sheet for which we um, estimate the meltwater fluxes and the method is uh, based on the work by uh, Lennartz et al., published here in uh, 2015 GRL paper. And here you can just see the historical melt rates. The uh, runoff are these bars here. Here's the scale. Uh, and then the, the circles are the calving rates. And um, as you go to the future projections, so this is a historical, if you go to the um, l a low kind of um, mitigation scenario here, RCP 2.6, and then to a high emission business as usual scenario, RCP 8.5, you can see how the uh, surface melt rates are projected to increase. Um, the calving rates stay the same because we don't know how they will change yet. Andreas, can I ask you to speak up just a little bit more, please? Yes, sure, sorry. Thank you. Um, so the, um, here is, uh, this figure shows the cumulative, so over, averaged over the entire Greenland ice sheet, the resulting runoff. Um, if um, based on CMIP-5 uh, temperature projections, um, where you can see for the RCP 4.5 scenario, melt rates start to increase um, during this century, um, but they level off and then um, do not increase very much further until the year 2300. And uh, by that time, they reach something like 0 0.015 or so, so they stay mostly around uh, below zero. 0 0.02 swear drop, um, although uh, there are smaller probabilities for somewhat larger fluxes. But all of them stay below 0 
thread drop. And on the right, uh, the corresponding fluxes for RCP 8.5 scenario. Now the vertical scale is different, so you can see um, there are some lower probabilities for higher fluxes, uh, up to 0.3 thread drop or so, but the, the mean, uh, the thick black line here, is a 0.1 thread drop um, for the next three centuries or so. And um, now if we compare this to the early work by Manaba and Stauffer, they did not include Greenland um, ice sheet melt, but they al already also estimated for kind of a high, a comparable four times CO2 high emission scenario, something like a 0.1 thread drop um, freshwater fluxes from the Greenland ice sheet. So very consistent with our um, now um, very detailed and um, estimates of, of the melt rates. And Madame and Stauffer also compared the ice sheet melt with the other changes of the water fluxes like the um, hydrological cycle, so P minus E uh, and runoff, which are much larger if you average over the North Atlantic. So that's why they suggested in their paper that the Greenland ice sheet melt will have if anything, a relatively small effect on the AMOC compared um, to these other um, hydrological cycle changes. Um, here are some of the um, GCM results with and without melting. So the solid lines are um, model runs without melting, and the dashed or dotted lines are simulations, including melting. Um, so here you can see all the um, seven models that have um, contributed to the um, project, and um, most of the time there is almost no discernible difference between the, uh, the simulations with and without melt. For example, here for the green one, which is CCSM4, RCP 4.5 scenario. But sometimes there is, for example, here the IPSL model in blue um, uh, does uh, show a, a weaker AMOC uh, due to um, melting. Um, for the RCP 8.5 scenario, you can see the uh, most models show very strong reduction in the AMOC, but um, the melt, additional melting does not seem to have a, a, a large impact. So um, this is consistent with the Manaber and Stauffer's early findings. Now, the, oh, these uh, just show the percentage changes, and it's essentially the same uh, story, so I'm going to sw go, go ahead to the probabilistic projections using the AMOC emulator. There you can see now for the RCP 4.5 scenario that um, both melting and temperature changes lead to something like a 20-25% reduction in the AMOC, and that the Greenland melt melting really um, does only very little, uh, so the temperature effect is really the most important there. And now if we go to the high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, there you can see um, again the, uh, the strong reduction in the AMOC, a dramatic reduction, and it continues throughout the, um, the um, time period considered here. Um, and now the Greenland ice sheet melt um, has some more appreciable um, impact um, in this emulator, um, and it leads to, you know, from neglecting it, you would get a stabilization, whereas if you include it, you get this continued decrease um, throughout the next three centuries. Now, how does that change salinities and temperatures in the North Atlantic? Um, here are some plots um, with just looking at one model. Um, so we, we choose the OSU VEC model, um, and um, the three rows are the end of the uh, this century, then the uh, 22nd and 23rd century. Um, so, um, um, and the and the the colors here show salinity changes. In blue is uh, fresh fresher conditions, and in red saltier. Um, and here is the in the top is the RCP 4.5 with Greenland um, ice sheet melt included and then the RCP 8.5 in the second row. Um, and then uh, in these rows below, um, it shows just the effect of the Greenland melting alone by subtracting the Greenland ice sheet run from the ones without the Greenland ice sheet melting. Um, and the, the scale here is also different for the lower, uh, for the lower panels. Um, but what we can see is essentially a freshening here in the subpolar North Atlantic in the runs uh, including ice melt, um, and it is, this freshening is stronger, uh, the, 
the longer we go into the future and also the uh, for the higher emission scenarios it gets more severe so here very large freshening at the end of the 23rd century in RCP 8.5 now if we look at the effect of the Greenland melting um, compared with the uh, changes in the total changes it is relatively small also con uh, note that here the scale is just half of the scale above here um, so here the main effect is some additional uh, freshening in the Labrador Sea um, and then here in uh, later stages uh, it expands uh, further to the uh, subpolar North Atlantic but compared with the original one it is relatively small changes um, but they in, uh, they add to the freshening in the subpolar North Atlantic and again for the RCP 8.5 that is more severe so there's more severe freshening there now the temperature distributions in this model um, again the same kind of panel um, organization here RCP 8.5 at the top and um, here in the second one RCP 8.5 sorry in the top RCP 4.5 and the three end of the cent next centuries um, in the horizontal um, order um, where you can see uh, the, the warming hole um, is uh, present in all of those simulations here consistent with early work by Manaba, Manaba and Stauffer um, and you can see as uh, as we go in more into the future for the longer term there is more warming and of course the higher emission scenarios has much more warming as well now the effect of the Greenland ice sheet is to uh, here in the RCP 4.5 scenario um, mostly to cool uh, although in the Nordic seas there is some warming um, we're we're not sure uh, we have not done a detailed an model analysis so we don't understand really why that warming occurs but around those regions where there's additional melt water from the Greenland ice sheet there seems to be a cooling effect um, that is also the case for the um, 21st century in RCP 8.5 but then for the RCP 8.5 in the 22nd and 23rd century there is a warming um, which we uh, also don't understand and I think this warming is also model dependent so this may be not a robust um, a feature so we need to work more on understanding these model responses so here are my conclusions the Greenland ice sheet melt impacts are relatively small in terms of temperature uh, also on AMOC um, for RCP 8.5 they lead to significant additional AMOC reductions melt induced surface freshening leads to increased stratification and surface cooling mainly um, but these uh, contributions are relatively small compared to the overall patterns and the warming hole that will continue into the future so uh, from that um, I would conclude that unlikely uh, that the Greenland ice sheet melting uh, was unlikely uh, has contributed uh, to the uh, warming hole um, in the last century or the for that matter, the current cold blob. And here are my heroes, uh, Suki Manabe and Ron Stauffer, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Andreas. <coughs> so um, we're going to go into Q&A now. So if you have questions for Andreas, um, as well as for Steve and Simon, um, please feel free to chime in. You can raise your hand. We can take you off mute. Um, you can also type them in the chat function. And we do have a question that came in during Steve's presentation, but Andreas, you may be able to answer this as well. It comes from Michelle. Um, she asks, would we expect to see a decrease in North Atlantic salinity with a reduction in AMOC? If so, has this decrease in salinity been observed in the polar North Atlantic? And you kind of were just talking about that a couple slides back, so she feels like it's been answered, but if there's anything you want to elaborate on that, um, feel free to. Um, due to a reduction in the AMOC, I think we we would expect um, a decrease in salinity, but also due to the um, enhancement of the hydrological cycle. So both would um, I would expect them to lead to freshening. Um, I'm not sure about the observations. Maybe some other uh, panelists can can talk about that. Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, just to say that, uh, yes, we would expect a, a freshening in the subpolar North Atlantic, 
associated with a weakening AMOC, but um, I also don't know if that freshening uh, has been observed um, or, or if a solidification has been observed in the mid-90s. I presume it, it, it occurred. Great. Um, we do have another question that came in from Dylan. Um, he said this is for anyone on the panel. It seems clear that the warm blob of the North Pacific and the cold blob of the North Atlantic are the result of different and possibly independent forcing mechanisms. Could it be merely coincidence then that they occurred nearly at the same time? Or is it possible they could be related in some currently unknown way? Anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> Uh, I, well, if I'm speaking, I mean, I think um, the North Atlantic one, you can, it, and in particular, it's a question of time scale as well. So if, if we're relating the two, that we're looking at quite short time scales. The North Atlantic one, I think we can certainly understand in terms of uh, the two modes of variability. And I just want to straight, strengthen the, or stress the point, because it's kind of contrary to what Steve was saying, that the winter 2013-14 is dominated not by the North Atlantic Oscillation. You, you cannot explain it in terms of a North Atlantic Oscillation, the extreme heat loss in that winter. It's down to the second mode of variability, the East Atlantic pattern. So uh, my overall point would be that what's happening in the North Atlantic in the last two to three years is a combination of two different modes of variability. So um, I don't think that that's likely to be connected to, the, to what's happening in the North Pacific. Um, at least not through the East Atlantic pattern component, which is quite which is quite localized. Thanks, Any comments for that? Else? Yeah, no, thanks. Anything else to add from Steve or Andreas? It's definitely a thought experiment. Dylan acknowledges. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have anything to add, um, but it's it's an inter interesting question. Um, we do have another question who came in from uh, PhD Canis, from the University of Illinois, Sarah. And her question is also for all three of you. She wanted to know, would a sustained cold blob slow the weakening of the AMOC? Well, I don't know about sustained cold blob, but um, I would mention that the, the, the last two to three years of strong NAO forcing, which had contributed to the, the cold blob, are also uh, going to enhance the production of North Atlantic deep water, uh, which if it persists, would tend to spin the thermohaline circulation back up and eventually uh, would, would warm the, the subpolar North Atlantic. Great. Any other questions from folks? Feel free to raise your hand if you'd like as well. We can we can go that way. I'll give you another few seconds. Okay. I think we'll wrap up here. Um, if anyone does ever have questions that come in, you can always email uh, me at the Clivar office, and uh, we we can forward those off to the speakers and get those answered. Um, but so let me um, thank everyone for attending today, and especially a big thanks to our three speakers, uh, both for writing the articles for our newsletter as well as doing this um, webinar series, which we're just now kicking off to do, um, and hopefully we'll do with all of our future editions of Variations, which come out quarterly. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, we do have another webinar coming up in July, not based on our variations. Um, but kind of stimulated from one of our working groups that we currently have. It's focusing on changes in the Arctic and the linkages with mid-latitude weather and climate. And it's an interesting debate that's going on among the community. So we have a webinar here on July 13th, also at noon Eastern time. And you can find that information on the US Clever website, both on our homepage as well as if you go under our meetings tab, you can find a list of all of our upcoming webinars. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll make this available online afterwards for any of those who are interested in sharing it with folks. And have a great weekend. <laughs>